The following program has been paid for by the Kerr for Senate Club. This is Washington. Here every day decisions are made that affect your country, your state, your community, affect you and your family. The share that you have in the making of these decisions is directly proportionate to the ability and the experience of the men you choose to represent you. There is no more important representation than the United States Senate, and few men in the Senate carry as much respect and authority as the senior United States Senator from Oklahoma, Robert S. Bob Kerr. Senator Kerr is ranking Democrat on the powerful Senate Finance Committee, ranking Democrat on the Public Works Committee, Chairman, Senate Subcommittee on Rivers, Harbors, and Flood Control, Member, the Public Works Subcommittee on Appropriations, Chairman, Select Committee on National Water Resources, Member, the Democratic Policy Committee, Member, the Senate Space Committee, Member, the Joint Committee on Non-Essential Federal Expenditures, Member, the Joint Committee on Internal Revenue Taxation. Now, let's visit Senator Kerr as he answers some questions that are important to you as Oklahomans and Americans. My fellow Oklahomans, those committee titles are not just so many honors for me. They are important because they are valuable to you. Each one of those committee appointments that I have earned over the years represents a means by which I am better able to serve you in Oklahoma. There are many committees in the Senate and I have carefully worked to get on certain ones of them. I have worked for these because of one thing, they can best serve you. I know this by what you yourself have told me, the questions you ask, the things you write me about, are subjects that most often are the business of the committees on which I serve. It makes me happy to know that by serving on these committees, I can best do the things you are most interested in. And as I talk with you about our work in Washington, I ask you to remember that I am just one of your delegation, all of whom work together for you as a team. In my job, just like in yours, I have to answer to my employer for what I do. And in my job, you are my employer. I'm never in the dark about what you want me to do because right here is a sample of my instructions, the Daily Mail. I'd like you to take a look at some of these letters with me. Dear Senator Kerr, I operate a farm in Seminole County. We're about to harvest another crop and sometimes, Senator, I wonder why. With the price squeeze we're caught in, there sure isn't a chance to make much profit. Maybe we won't even break even. Many of my neighbors have already quit, given up, and moved to town. I don't want to quit. I like farming. But every year it seems I have to pay more for what I buy and get less for what I sell. I can't expect my boy to put up with this if it doesn't change. What do you think is the answer? I think the answer is to get rid of the disease called Ezra Bensonitis. The short-sighted, calloused farm policies of Dick and Ike and Ezra have failed miserably and completely. Since 1952, farm income is down 23%. Yet the cost of the farm program and of operating the Department of Agriculture has zoomed up more than 500%. I've fought against this trend continuously. It's not only much too costly for the taxpayers, it's not effective for the farmers. When people talk about down on the farm these days, they might as well face the cold, hard facts of the rough role the farmers are having to hold. Our fight for them is not easy, but neither is farming. When I see the future dimmed for our fine farm youth, I know that our fight for them must continue. And I'm going to continue to fight for rural electrification in Oklahoma. Oklahoma's rural electrical rates are already 11% under the national average. Future needed improvements will mean an additional investment in this state of $47 million in the next five years. I've had some real battles for REA 
and most of them have been successful. The REAs must be able to continue to expand their service and their record of repaying borrowed government funds justifies our faith in them. Well, I could go on and on about the answers to hundreds of letters from farmers, but let's look at another problem from Oklahoma. This letter begins, Dear Senator, I'm a small businessman. I just wish you could see what foreign competition is doing to us. I mean goods made in Japan and China and Germany and Austria. Now, these goods come in and sell much cheaper than the things we make here. I've got a small factory with about 80 employees. We turn out good merchandise because we have good people working with good raw materials. And I'm not about to ask my employees to step down to the living standard of Japanese, even if they could. Yet the Japs manufacture the same things I do. But because of the low wages they pay their workers, they can ship their goods 8,000 miles and they can still sell cheaper than I can. Now this isn't limited to me. It's true all up and down the main streets of Oklahoma. Everything from toys to wearing apparel is being shipped in from foreign countries to help destroy the future of American businesses and American workers. I'd like to know how you feel about it. This is a condition which should not exist and which must not continue to be tolerated. The battle is between so-called reciprocal trade versus made in America. My record shows that I have been firmly on the side of Made in America. For many years now, I have opposed the extension of the Reciprocal Trade Act. And one of the reasons I want to return to Congress as your senator is to continue to work to protect our domestic industries by limiting unfair foreign competition. One thing the mail reminds me of every day is that a senator must represent all the people in the state, not just the business people and the farmers, but everybody. And many of our people are no longer able to earn their own living through no fault of their own. In most cases, they are our senior citizens, those who have made great contributions to our state, but who now, through age or ill health, are on the sideline. Now here is a typical letter from a senior citizen of o Dear Senator Kerr, I guess you get some letters complaining about things, and so I figure you'd sort of appreciate a letter of thanks. Now, I'd just like to tell you how much I appreciate what you've done for all of us who are getting along in years. Now, before you went to the Senate, I got an assistance check of about $50 a month. Now, that didn't buy many groceries or pay many doctor bills. But thanks to senators like you, my average monthly payments has gone up to over $75. So I just wanted to thank you, Senator, for all that you've done to make things a little easier for folks in my circumstances. Well, you know, a letter like that makes me proud of every bit of legislation that I have sponsored or supported that has helped our senior citizens. In 1949, when I first became your Senator, the elder people on assistance in our state received an average payment of a little over $51 per month. Payments in the state <coughs> for Social Security were only $1,125,000 per month. Today, the average payment to our senior citizens has risen to $79.86 per month, for a total of $8,800,000 per month. In addition to this, these Oklahomans now receive an additional $1,128,000 in medical pa care payments, and they receive over $8,000,000 per month in Social Security payments. Another thing I get a lot of letters about is roads. People are concerned about Oklahoma's position in the national road program. I can promise you that Oklahoma will not be discriminated against in roads as long as I am in the Senate. That's one reason I put in so much time on the Public Works Committee. It handles road legislation. Federal road money spent in our state has been greatly increased by bills and amendments I have sponsored directly or helped to write. During my two terms, 
$248,600,000 has been secured to help build roads in Oklahoma. That is twice the total Oklahoma had received in the 28 years before I came to the Senate. I sponsored the amendment that fixed the formula of 90% federal funds to 10% state funds for interstate roads, for providing federal funds for farm-to-market roads, and to get Oklahoma a greater proportionate share of federal road money. I want to continue to see that more and better roads are built in Oklahoma. And, of course, I get thousands of letters about another problem that is of deep concern to every American, national defense. We are all aware of the threat of communism abroad. I'm just as concerned about it right here at home and next door to us in Cuba. We must restore the respect for America that has been so flagrantly distorted. Now, defense installation are vital to our national security. And I have helped to locate and to enlarge many defense installations in Oklahoma. Since 1946, $275 million has been invested in Oklahoma defense installations. Today, the annual civilian payroll of these installations in Oklahoma is $132 million and the annual military payroll in Oklahoma is $118 million. I'm happy to report that the missile launching sites that I worked so hard to get for southwestern Oklahoma are already under construction. I shall continue to use my position and every ounce of influence I possess in Washington to safeguard Oklahoma's position in our national defense picture. Now, I received this letter just the other day on another phase of national defense. Here it is. Dear Senator, I'm an independent oil operator. I know what you've done as a member of the Senate for the oil industry in Oklahoma. I just have one thought. I read a lot about our preparations for national defense. But if we don't get our own American oil and gas business back on its feet, and if a national emergency would cut off all that foreign oil that some would like to keep on flooding our country with, where would we be? The answer to that is simple. We must restore our domestic oil industry to a point where it will be healthy and strong enough to do the job that it did in World War I and II and might have to do again. We've made some progress in holding oil imports to a level that will encourage more exploration and development in this country. But we must do more. Now this is important to every Oklahoman, whether he is in or out of the oil business, because oil is not only vital to our very existence in case of a national emergency, it is a major factor in the economic prosperity of our state. Here's part of what I have been able to do so far. I have vigorously opposed reduction of the depletion allowance, reduction and federal regulation of independent gas producers' prices. I've urged the expansion of helium extraction facilities and a federal policy of production, storage, and conservation of helium to benefit Oklahoma. I've opposed gasoline tax increases and helped secure the repeal of the excise tax on pipeline transportation of oil. I authored the amendment permitting the charge off of intangible drilling costs. I want to continue this work for this great Oklahoma industry because I am as opposed to the cold dead hands of governmental control on oil and gas as I am on any other American business. And then we've had a terrific fight to try to protect the lead and zinc mining business in Oklahoma. It too has been the victim of foreign importation, and I want to say that thus far we have failed to do what should be done, but we still have hopes of making some accomplishment in this direction, and we know there is a great deal more to do. 
Now, I want to talk to you about uh, some natural resources that are even more precious than oil, lead and zinc, gas, or all of the gold at Fort Knox. That's the soil that supports us, the trees that help to hold our soil, and the water that falls from the heavens. As you know, I've been keenly interested in our water problems in Oklahoma even before I went to the Senate. I've seen, just as you have, what a lack of water can mean. I've seen our precious soil blown away, and I've seen entire communities impoverished. I've seen prosperous farms ruined, families bankrupt. Then, just as you have, I have seen what has happened under the pressure of a terrible flood of water, too much of it and too fast. I've seen it washing away homes, farms, and even human lives. I've seen those floods carrying our topsoil down the rivers to the Gulf, where it can never raise another blade of vegetation for Oklahoma. That's why you find me chairman of the Subcommittee on Rivers and Harbors and Flood Control, chairman of the Select Committee on National Water Resources, and ex officio member of the Public Works Subcommittee on Appropriations and ranking Democrat on the Public Works Committee. There hasn't been a day go by that I haven't worked on these problems. I'd like to show you just what's been done on this conservation program of land, wood, and water. Twelve years ago, the first piece of legislation I introduced as a senator from Oklahoma set up the Arkansas White Red River Basin's Study Committee. This report blueprinted the Water Resources Development Program for our state. A very important part of the conservation program is upstream flood control, keeping as much water where it falls as possible. I've been able to strengthen and enlarge the benefits of the upstream flood control program of the Soil Conservation Service. Public Law 566 was enacted in 1954, amended by Public Law 1018 in 1956. Under it, Oklahoma leads all other states in the percentage of total acres in approved watershed projects in relation to the total acres in the state. Watershed protection projects under these laws have received over $16.5 million in construction funds. The Washita project has received nearly $24.5 million, making a total of $41 million. The Bureau of Reclamation maintains an office in Oklahoma. Over $40 million have been spent in the state by this Bureau in the construction of these federal pro reclamation projects, the Altus Lugert project, the Foss project, and the Cobb Creek project. Three-fourths of that $40 million has been secured during my two terms in the Senate. Furthermore, a bill was introduced by my fellow colleague in the Senate, Mike Monroney, and myself, authorizing the $19 million project for the Little River on the Little River near Norman. Congress has, has approved this fine project. Right now, three other survey reports are complete and six additional projects are in the process of being surveyed. I want to follow these through to completion. That this can be done is already indicated. Senator Monroney and myself offered an amendment the other day to increase our upstream watershed construction appropriation by $5 million. Not many days ago, in a fight on the Senate floor, we succeeded in getting the Senate to adopt that amendment. Now here is an up-to-date picture of soil and water development in Oklahoma. This map shows a picture not to be found of any other state in the Union. <clears throat> it shows the completed and the projected and the proposed reservoir programs and sites and buildings in Oklahoma. 
It shows the watershed protection and upstream flood prevention programs. It shows those for which applications have been received, for which applications are pending, for which applications are planned. It shows those where construction is in progress or approved and those where the construction has been completed. You do not see too many in this part of Oklahoma, although there are some reservoirs now and proposed. This is in the Great Plains Development Program. Yes, the Great Plains Project is important, not only to the people in that area, but because it demonstrates that our land, wood, and water program goes all the way from southeastern Oklahoma down where Little River runs into the red, up to the farthest reaches of the Panhandle. It takes in this great Washita soil conservation and upstream protection program. It takes in the world-famed sandstone project on the Washita. And I want to say this about these projects upstream. They not only are of great importance to our farm people, they are of great importance to the communities in those areas. Under the law, as we helped to amend it in 1956, it provides the possibility for municipal water in great and vast areas of Oklahoma where it was not before possible. But as I think of all of this, I'm so happy that it reaches all of Oklahoma. And now I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the program of navigation on the Arkansas River. You know, a few years ago when we started talking about that, many laughed. But I want to say this, that many who came to scorn remained to pray. Under the authorizations and under the projects now being built, Eufaula on the Canadians, Keystone on the Arkansas and Cimarron, Uluga on the Vertigris. When these projects are completed, along with the others already constructed on the tributaries of the Arkansas, and then when we have built the reservoirs on the channel of the Arkansas itself, and put in the installations of the locks and the dams, these great rivers will be chained. No more will their mighty rolling floods and tides of waters crush the people in the area, their crops and their hopes. But when we have chained these waters, we will have just begun the job then we must harness them to work for us. I fly over this area quite often. When I see either those streams filled with floodwaters rolling with the silt and soil carrying it from our state to the Gulf of Mexico, or when I fly over it and those streams are dry, I do not see the present conditions. I see in the future when this will be a navigation channel, when it will be carrying barge traffic, carrying from our state the tons, yes, the thousands of tons of our products and our resources to the markets of the world at transportation rates that will enable us to develop a great industrial empire. I've thrilled as I've heard such men as General Itchner of the Corps of Engineers talk about the way the industrial structure on the Ohio River was developed. I've seen the development in the Tennessee Valley, but I say this to you, with the great volume of uncommitted fresh water we have, with the tremendous quantity of low-cost energy fuel that is ours, when our navigation project is complete, we will have the foundation for the building of an industrial structure as progressive and as valuable as any that exist in our country. 
And as I look into the future, I see this development in terms of production of Oklahoma products, of trade and commerce, of things built or originating in Oklahoma, and in terms of payrolls. And that's the reason that it means so much to me and to you. And I appreciate your tremendous acceptance of it and your support of it. Yes, river basin development, soil, water conservation, roads, industry, old age assistance, social security, and so the mail goes. As you have kept me informed of your beliefs and your problems. And I'm truly grateful for these letters because that's the good way that you and I can work together in building a greater and more prosperous Oklahoma. So let me wind this up by writing a letter to you, a letter to each citizen in Oklahoma. My fellow Oklahoman, I humbly thank you for the trust and the confidence you have given me in my two terms in the United States Senate. I take pride in what I have been able to accomplish for our state and for our nation. I am hopeful that my efforts in your behalf meet with your approval. I hope that you will show that approval by giving you, me your help and support in this election. By re-electing me as your senator, your voice and your views will, be, will continue to be heard with ever-increasing effect on the floor of the Senate and in its committee rooms. Yes, we have made great progress. Oklahoma has become a force to be reckoned with in the nation's Congress. The committees through which I serve you, the senatorial rank I have achieved, not alone from my efforts, but by reason of your support, these are priceless assets to a still young and growing state. This Oklahoma of ours, its God-given abundance with its strong and vigorous people and its boundless faith and optimism can and will fulfill its destiny. I ask you to let me continue my work toward realizing that future by re-electing me as your senior United States Senator. And so, with all good wishes to you, I am sincerely yours, Robert S. Kerr. The date of the primary election is Tuesday, July 5th. As this date nears, please remember this. One of the most priceless foundations of our American heritage is the right to vote, to express an opinion at the polls. Especially in the world today, it is important to act as Americans and vote. Free elections are the strength of our democratic system of government, and strength comes from exercise. That is why it is so necessary to exercise your right to vote by going to the polls on July 5th. If you're going to be away from your home, plan ahead and make use of an absentee ballot. Above all, remember this. Your vote counts, so make sure you are counted among those Oklahomans who go to the polls and take advantage of the precious right to vote. Tuesday, July 5th. The preceding program was paid for by the Kerr for Senate Club.